The title of this body of work is Into the Great White Sands. Um, I like to start there because th this, this, this name, the Great White Sands, um, actually came by way of, um, of, um, of uh, a booster for, uh, for this place prior to it becoming uh, even a, it first began as a national monument. Actually, it first began as just this open area that people used to hang out in. Um, they used to go out there and play baseball and all this kind of stuff. Then all of a sudden there was a, the, the, the town sort of got together and said, gee, we ought to get the, the federal government involved. And so they eventually in 1933 turned it into a national monument, which is kind of a, some people might say is kind of a poor stepsister to, um, to what a national park is today. Um, basically the difference of them is that a national monument is something that is created by presidential decree. Um, a national park is created by uh, uh, an act of Congress. And so that's kind of the basic difference between them. Um, I, I think there's some financial uh, uh, benefits that national parks have that monuments don't have. Fortunately, last year, um, uh, White Sands National Monument became White Sands National Park. Um, so it's now a fully fledged member of the National Park, you know, group, I guess. Um, anyway, um, so I added the word into, just to give you the rest of that story real quick, I added the word into because I sort of thought the Great White Sands is beautiful, but I needed people to know that it was a place to go to or into to really experience. So here I am, huh? 1965. Um, I, I like to show this picture because you know it was take it. It seems like you know it came from like a, a dream I had a very long time ago. Greg, um, are you sharing your screen? We can't see your screen. Oh, I'm sorry. Let's try that again. Yeah. Now, can you see it? Um, no. Yes, now we can. Now you can see it? Okay, good. I'm really sorry about that. Um, yeah, so here I am. Uh, this little guy, you know, 1965 with my first real camera. Um, it's a, an old Diana, little plastic camera that my parents bought me for less than $10 probably. Um, um, I like to show this photograph, not, not to show you how cute I was, um, but you can see I'm missing a couple of teeth there. Um, but more importantly, you can see uh, something that's incredibly important uh, to photographers, which is luck. Um, you'll notice that off the toggle, that first toggle there above the camera is a, um, is a, is a rabbit's foot. In this case, a lucky rabbit's foot. And I, I've attributed a lot of success in photography, uh, not only to sort of knowing how to use the you know, equipment and manipulate the materials, but also to something that you know, I'm not even in control of in the end, you know, and that is you know, luck. That, you know, although I'm always, something, always reminded of something that Louis Pasteur said about you know, chance favoring the prepared mind. So I guess I wanna hope that I'm prepared when I go out and make pictures. Um, you can decide when you take a look at these pictures and see if I was. Um, I like to show this too, just because it's kind of fun. I did a body of work on um, uh, on something that was very close to the heart of uh, Catholic Hispanic New Mexico. Um, I did a body. My first book that I did was a book on uh, the uh, Penitenti Moradas, which are chapter houses belonging to a lay order of Catholic people here in New Mexico. Um, they're dotted all uh, called the, the, the Penitenti Brotherhood, and they're all across the state. They're often in kind of up hidden canyons and things like that. But this is a lay order of the Catholic Church uh, that believes in the passion of Christ. And so they reenact that, that passion every year uh, during Holy Week, the week before Easter. Anyway, the, the, the person who, one of the people that's involved in the organization is, is a man named Charlie Carrillo, who's also a saint maker, and he made this for me. I like to show this just because it's kind of, you know, my first serious camera. 
Um, I got this when I moved to the United States. I purchased one of these, a uh, Yashica, and it was my best friend before I, I figured out how to, you know, acclimate to living in this new place, this new culture, these new people. Um, I made a lot of photographs with, with this camera. I took it all the way to Alaska even and made photographs with it. It was an amazing, amazing piece of equipment. And, and I, I still look back at it fondly. I regret deeply that I ever let this camera go. Um, it was like a this, 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 this time travel thing that when I had it in my hands, I could go anywhere and be anywhere. It was, it was, it was amazing. Um, I use all kinds of cameras. People like to know this. This happens to be my five by seven uh, view camera. It uses five by seven or five inches by seven inch uh, film. Um, that's what it looks like anyway. I've used a lot of cameras over the years. I don't think that good photographs are the result of having good cameras. I think that they just make the process uh, a little bit easier. And I use this, you know, a lot now. This is a Nikon. Um, it's a D850. Um, and I like to show it because people always ask, you know, you take these pictures, you must be really using good equipment. And it's probably true, but it's, it's a bit like trying to liken, you know, you know, Ernest Hemingway writing, you know, uh, one of his books and someone saying, you know, that he must have a good typewriter. Um, I don't think that Ernest Hemingway had a particularly good typewriter, he probably had, a, you know, good enough one for him. Um, but his books came out of his mind. And I guess I want to believe that art comes from that same place. It comes from the mind and the heart of the artist. So I, I love this camera and tripod and bag all over all over white sands. And this is just one happy little you know accident that I had while I turned around and saw my camera sitting there, um, and I saw this cloud that reminded me of a swan sort of coming across the dune. So I snapped this photograph with my iPhone. I also print my photographs. I'm really a big believer in that. And all of the prints that are in the uh, exhibition at the museum were all made here in my, uh, in my dark room, in my, my studio here in, in Santa Fe. I use a Canon printer. That's, that's it right there. Um, and so I've had a lot of shows. I, 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 I like to show my work. I've been very fortunate to, to gain you know, support from, from wonderful museums uh, like the Western Heritage. Um, um, this happens to be a body of work that I did on Ghost Ranch years ago. And people, you know, the museum was so fascinated by the gear that I used, they asked if we could put, you know, one of my cameras in a, in a, in a case for people to look at. And this is my most recent book. This, this came out last, uh, last Christmas. Um, it was a retrospective. It was put together by my uh, assistant, Cindy Lane. It's called The Light of Days Gone By, and it's a collection of images that were made over my career as a photographer. Um, what a joy to put this together, you know, and work with her to, to, to see it come to, to completion. Um, a book is, is a wonderful affirmation, you know, of, of of creating a body of work and, and in this case, creating a lifetime's body of work. I've been making pictures now for 40 years. And this picture I made shortly after I got married. So I'm also on the web. I thought I'd show you just a quick snap of, you know, my webpage. Uh, it's www.craigvergebedian.com. So you can go over there and you can see all kinds of images and I've got a blog up there and you know, all kinds of information about myself. But if you really want to look at the pictures, um, just click on photographs and you'll have all kinds of pages there of things that you can take a look at. So I invite you to come by when you have a moment. So here we go, we're at White Sands. Um, and this is the book that we published on this. Um, the museum has copies of this and I think they were posting a phone number that you can call and get an autographed copy uh, from them. Um, Help the museum, support the museum, please. Um, they allow for artists like myself to show their work and they're just all around good people. So um, I, I can't say enough that, you know, your purchase um, absolutely makes a difference. So we're going to White Sands, um, White Sands National Park today, you know, no longer 
White Sands National Monument when this postcard was actually first created. Um, uh, an assistant of mine, you know, did a little Photoshop work on it and changed it into National Park New Mexico uh, versus what it said in the 1940s when this postcard was originally published. I love to show this image. I love to show this image because this is opening day uh, when the park first as, as a national as a, as a national monument first opened um, in 1934. And this is the crowd of people that showed up uh, to, to be a part of it. And one of the cool things about this is, is that this picture was taken with what is called a circuit camera. And if you look down in the lower uh, left side, you see kind of the shadow of the camera. And basically the way, it's, the way this camera works is, is that the camera has film in it. And what it does, it turns. And as it turns, the film actually passes by a slit in the back of the camera and it exposes this piece of film. Then of course it's developed and then prints are made. This, this picture was made by a photographer in Silver City. So White Sands. Now, most of you probably know where it is, but, but just in case you don't, um, you get a sense of it from this wonderful little map that shows you where White Sands National Monument is in relationship to the state of New Mexico. And if you look here a little closer, um, you can sort of see what's around it. You know, you can see where Carlsbad is. You can see where the monument is or the national park is. You can see where Grand Canyon is and Zion and Bryce Canyon and Mesa Verde. By the way, this map, these two maps I'm just showing you were produced in the 1930s, right after this became a national monument. So this is the park today, um, just to give you a sense of what we're gonna be talking about. So if you take a look first, you can realize that the dune field, which is on the left is like at Lake Lucero and it goes all the way north, all the way up to even beyond like Socorro um, is all uh, parts of, uh, of the original uh, uh, um, white sand dunes. The park, which is in that lower part of the, of the picture there, um, basically is the area that's open to the visitor. And that area is 275 square miles. And it is um, just west of, of Alamogordo, New Mexico, east of Las Cruces, New Mexico. Um, and it is an absolutely beautiful place. Um, you can see the, Sa the, the San Andres Mountains uh, on, the, on, the, uh, on the west side of the park. Um, on the other side, at where it says cooperative use area boundary, um, that area, the, the, who they cooperate with is the White Sands Missile Range, which is mostly known for um, two things. I mean, it's mostly known for a lot of things, but the things that may be, you know, in, 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 within popular culture is certainly the Trinity site where the first uh, atomic bomb was set off. And secondly, um, where... Um, where the uh, space shuttle was landed, Columbia was landed there at one point. So let's go. Um, this, this shows you a little bit of what um, the Missile Range Museum looks like. Um, these are some of the things that have been launched from that place. And I was just sort of like seeing all of them, you know, just knowing that they're there. Um, it, it's, it's a wonderful, you know, uh, uh, nod to all of the things that have that have you know that have that have taken place on on this landscape. In particular, though, is this this is the von Braun gantry and what this essentially is. So so at the end of World War II, the Allies brought uh, uh, von Braun and a lot of other German scientists to the United States to to basically jumpstart the American rocket program, and um, they brought with them their V two. Uh, they, they literally packed up V2 rockets and brought them here to the U.S. And this is the gantry that was built to launch them. And if you go to the missile range to the museum there, you can actually see a model or actually see a real V2 that's been kind of taken apart so you can see what's inside. But this is where America's space program begins. This is where the first, you know, major launches happened. And this is where out on the out on the um, um, out in that area of cooperative use that you saw 
is where um, Space Shuttle Columbia was landed. And this uh, runway was actually built for exactly this. Um, unfortunately, they found out that um, there was just, it, it, it made the space shuttle so dirty that they couldn't land it there again. That it took them almost a year to clean the thing out and get all of the sand out of the, the various working parts of the, of the shuttle. So they stopped landing there after that. But the shuttle, I mean, the, the, the landing strip still remains. Also over on the missile range is the remains of the Anasazi. And here you can see some, uh, some, some painted uh, uh, um, drawings. So here we go. So here's the blast that took place at Trinity. Um, I know there's a lot of a lot of you know difference uh, of how people perceive this, and I'm not trying to get into that here. It's it's merely just kind of a a fact a factual sort of thing. It happened, and this is where it happened. But this is the site right here. This is the Trinity site that on July 16, 1945, the world uh, detonated the first uh, uh, nuclear device. And it, interestingly, um, it's it was detonated in a place called Canyon del Muerto. So, you know, Canyon of Death. Um, anyway, it's, it's, it's actually, this part is managed by the national parks um, and you can go in twice a year, uh, once in April and, and it's open again on a weekend in October. Mind you, COVID may have thrown that whole thing in array, but, but in a normal sort of year, that's, that was, the, you, could, you could go here and hear talks and walk around this place and everything else. But our talk is about White Sands National uh, Park. And so I thought I'd start by maybe showing you a dune just so you could sort of see it. The thing that's really interesting to notice about the dunes is of course that they're white, but they're not traditionally white or not typically white. I mean, in that what you're seeing here is not silica sand, but instead what you're seeing is gypsum. Okay, and they're just two different materials. Okay, white sands, ends up being created from uh, these crystals of selenite that, 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 that are, are, are being created, even as we speak, out, out next to the lake. And what happens is when it rains, the runoff from the, the San Andres Mountains collects down in there and it dries up and it creates these crystals, as you can see. And they, they break down because of wind and other water that falls on them. And, and eventually they break down into something that is softer than your fingernails. And once they do that, then they start to roll. The wind keeps blowing them. And as they blow, they break down even more. So when they get you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 miles away over into the park, let's say, you, know, you have white sand. And so this is where it begins. So I show you this map again, just for, just for giggle, giggles and grins. So you can kind of see where, if you look over near Lake Lucero, that's kind of where this, is to, this, this, this action is taking place. It's that water running off the, off the San Andres Mountains that collects down you know, in Alkali Flats and creates these, 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 this, this gypsum, or excuse me, these selenite crystals. I started photographing white sands because I think it really wasn't a, 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 a decision that I made. Like I went out to buy, you know, a loaf of bread. It, 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 what happened was, was that I, I found white sands early on when I was doing other work and I was going down there when I needed to decompress. Uh, my wife would say that I would go down there um, to find my smile. And I think it's probably true. I think that when, you know, things we get frustrated in, in my work, I found that this was just a great place to, you know, to, to, to kick back and get a release and, and, you know, sort of find myself again. And I started, you know, just, I brought a camera along just for kind of for fun and, you know, see what would happen. And I started making, I, I one day decided to go out and start making a few pictures. And I went ahead and I made this picture and I got home and I processed it. This was made on film. And I went, oh my God, look at what I created. And as, after I made this, um, I realized that there was something there for me to photograph. And so I went back and I made even more pictures. And then I made even more pictures. 
And I realized that I was being called, you know, I'd like, I, I want to believe it was by the place, but maybe it was by something else, who knows. Um, but I was being called to make these photographs and I made them. And subsequently at the same time, my publisher, uh, the University of New Mexico Press came to me and said, hey, Craig, you know, we haven't had a book from you for a while. Um, what would you like to do? We just saw your White Sands work and it's beautiful. What about a book on White Sands? And I said, yeah, I think this could be an incredible thing. And so if you have a chance to see the book, um, you can see the result yourself. Anyway, um, the place called me and it kept calling me for, for a period of about five years. And I was going down there roughly for two weeks at a time. And I'm assuming, yeah, I was going out for two weeks at a time and then coming home for a week. And I would do that over a period of, uh, like I say, that, that five year period. And I made pictures every time I was down there. So I made thousands of photographs. Some I think were more successful than others, um, but I made a lot of photographs. And I think that was the biggest challenge in this project when I finally got to a point where, you know, the, the publisher wanted to publish it, but I only had, you know, room for, I think about 80 photographs. I had to, you know, pull together, you know, from thousands of photographs, I had to wheedle that down to, winnow that down to, to 80 photographs. It was a huge challenge. It took me months to figure it out. So this is the moon setting over the San Andres Mountains where that, that water runs down the mountain and creates that selenite. One of the things I, I've been I have really been struck by is that, as many of you probably know, New Mexico is is just blessed with 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 sunsets, and there's something about the sunsets at White Sands that are even seem to me to be even better than the sunsets I see up here in northern New Mexico. Mind you, the ones here are really beautiful, but the ones down at White Sands are just you know extraordinary. You know, they remind me of that movie by Walt Disney, Fantasia, you know, all that color and everything else. This just happens to be one example. And by the way, just so that you know, it would be very easy for me to sort of tart this stuff up in, in using the, you know, the tools on the computer. But what you're seeing in these pictures for the most part is pretty doggone close to what it was that I saw when I made these photographs. So White Sands becomes this place that people go and there was a park ranger there um, a, a while ago named Becky, and Becky used to tell me that White Sands could become whatever the person who was coming there wanted it to be. So if you want to go, you know, fly a kite there, there's a place to do that, you know. Um, if you want to go, like in this case, these folks want to go snowboarding, which these were the only folks I ever saw in five years going down there that snowboarded. So there you go. Um, everybody, I guess, finds their own thing when they're there. Um, this is the, um, the uh, headquarters for the visitor center for, for White Sands National Park. I like to show it because it is, there, there are so few of them, but this is a WPA building. It's built during the Works uh, uh, Progress Administration under um, Franklin Roosevelt. And what you're kind of looking at here, you see there's a parking lot there, but back in the 30s when this building was first put up, um, if you take a look at that, that awning that's there, that, that, that portal that you see, that's how people used to drive into the park in the old days. Another thing that was designed specifically for white sands were the picnic tables. And I, I think of them as alien pots, you know, sort of out there in the landscape, because you know they're they're so efficient, certainly at providing shade when you're out on the on a hot day at White Sands. But the way they look is is so surreal to me that uh, um, um, I, I think of them as little spaceships or something. You know, they're, they're I think they're quite remarkable. So the dunes. Here they are, you know, this is a bar can dune. Um, I was always fascinated, not only with the dunes in groups and in clusters, but I was also interested in, in them singularly because they seem to have a kind of power, you know, a single dune seemed like it, it, it was 
you know, something powerful, like it was sentient in some way. And I think that this dune um, is, is an example of that. The other thing that also happens is that the dunes are constantly changing. So for example, if I took this picture, you know, on a Monday and I were to come back two weeks later, this dune would look different probably, depending upon what the weather was doing. So the one thing you have to, I had to do when I was making these photographs was I had to make the pictures when I saw them because there was no going, there typically wasn't an opportunity to go back again. I made this photograph, you know, one, uh, one day and I, I never, I never could find it again. Even when I went back three days later, I could not find where this thing was. So it either moved on or I got lost. And I love the ripples that are created by the wind and the water. And that's kind of what you're seeing here. I'm also really in love with the, you know, with the vegetation that grows there. Um, what you're looking at here is uh, the yuccas that are um, that are just starting to bloom down in the lower right hand corner, and um, in the um, um, up 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 atop of the dune there are um, are pods that have already opened from the previous year. This is called Indian rice grass, and I, I was showing this uh, to a former student who said that she thought that these were the eyelashes of, of, of white sands. You know, I kind of like that, like an eye was closed and these are the lashes. I just, I love that image. One of the things I was struck by too, and I'm going to talk more about this, was that there's this incredible interaction that almost takes place between the land and the sky at White Sands. It's so incredibly dramatic, you know. Um, the sky, the sky, the sky, the sky. Yeah, it's an amazing thing. This picture was taken uh, early at sunrise. Um, when you know the, the the clouds from the previous evening are catching the first rays of the of the of the sun rising, and uh, you get these beautiful fuchsia and yellows and oranges and this and that. Those are yuccas. They're they're um, they've already bloomed. So this picture was taken late in the, late in the season, probably in October. Out on the dunes, there are these these um, these landforms that are called pedestals, and what they have is um, they 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 happen because sumac starts growing in the sand, and then and and what you see and and, and of course they they put down roots, and um, um, then what happens is that the dune moves on. These dunes are constantly moving. And you can see here, what's happened is, is that this dune has moved on. And when it moved on, what you're seeing is what was left. You know, what the, what the, uh, um, what the sumac is, is uh, and, and its roots are holding on to. And so you can see how tall that dune was at one point because of the height of the sumac. But when I made this picture, I, I really, I just got this sense that, you know, that the, the, that the land was almost conducting the sky. You know that the like like the conductor in an orchestra. You know the <coughs> the, the 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 pedestals were telling the sky sort of what to do, and I've always kept that image in my mind as I photograph because I just sense this strong connection between the land and the sky, particularly when when the pieces would start kind of working together. You know, synergistically, visually synergistically.
I think the clouds in this picture are absolutely stunning. And you can see what's happening here is the clouds, uh, uh, the sun is already starting to set in the western sky, but there are another bank of clouds that's kind of covered, at least shading the land below it. And so that's why the land, you know, the sand below it is that, is that, uh, is that, uh, um, it sits in the shadows basically. And as I said, sunsets, you know, at White Sands are absolutely incredible. And this is certainly no exception. I went out and I made this picture while there, I, I don't recommend this, by the way, do not, do not, do not do this. But there was lightning uh, all around when I climbed up a dune really fast, you know, shot this and then got back in my car. Um, one thing they don't want you to do is to be out on the dunes when, it, when there is lightning can be pretty dangerous. Nighttime. Mm. Um, white, going, going to White Sands at night is a little bit more complicated, in part because the park is usually open from roughly uh, an hour after sunrise, and they close about an hour after sunset. So getting access to go out there at night does require some, some uh, uh, working with the National Park Service to, to, to gain access, and you can buy permits to do this. The other option is, is that you can, you can, um, um, you can camp in the, uh, in the tent camping area that they have, the backcountry camping area. Um, in this case, I had gone ahead and made arrangements with the Park Service to stay out there. And you can see this was, uh, this was late fall. Um, this, by the way, is a cottonwood tree. And you can see how the bottom of the cottonwood tree is covered by, you know, uh, by a dune. And so this is just the top of the tree poking out. This probably goes down another eight feet or 10 feet. But there too, you can also see the, the uh, uh, Milky Way and you can see the lights of, of, um, of El Paso uh, and Las Cruces uh, on the horizon. Here's another one of these pedestals. You know, I think they're quite stunning in their own way. And here you can also see the Milky Way on the left over there. Um, you can also see that little streak at, uh, at the top there from a uh, southbound uh, um, airplane. You'll notice this picture has a bit of yellow in it. Um, Part of the reason for that is that next to White Sands is um, the Holloman um, Air Force Base. And the, the lights on the Air Force Base are these yellow sodium vapor lights and they just light up the sky. And I thought about one point about, you know, going in digitally and, you know, cleaning all this up, but then I decided no, that really wasn't true to the place. In other words, if you were out there at night standing next to me, this is kind of what you would see. Yuccas and things that grow. Yuccas, magnificent, magnificent uh, uh, plants that grow over much of, of white sands. What you're seeing here is a yucca that is a few days before it, it will bloom, but that probably is about a week's worth of growth. So it grew that, 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 that whole length in one week. And in another week, it would have probably started blooming. And here we are, that's what they look like. And they have a sweet, sweet smell. Um, the other thing that also grows at White Sands is this, what's called sand verbena. And um, I kept thinking that there were lilies. Every time I would brush into this stuff, I used to think, because it would let off this, this smell that would smell like Easter lilies, you know, very, very sweet. Um, almost too much so, I found. The, the, the green stuff is Indian rice grass. And so I started photographing Indian rice grass for almost a couple, for like almost two days. And one of the things I started to see was that these almost looked like Zen brush strokes to me. 
And so I began kind of putting together these abstract photographs of the, of the, of the grass creating these sort of these lines uh, uh, within the rectangle. Here's some yuccas. So here you can kind of see new growth and you can kind of see old growth. If you look over to the right, you can see there are some pods that have already let go of their seeds from the previous year. And you can also kind of see too how this dune, uh, the dune in the, in the, in the, in the, in behind all of this actually was, in, was, was covering all of this at one point and it had moved on. And eventually the, the blooms um, fall off. And here you can see older uh, pods that have fallen and you can see some of the new blooms that it, where, the, where they've fallen off. And you can see the darkling beetles you know, going after them, um, looking for water. This is another example of the dune sort of taking over, you know, the the yucca plant, you can see that this is already starting to get buried by the, by the dune. I haven't been back in a year because of COVID. So um, I suspect that if when I get down there, that, you know, in a couple of weeks, um, that dune, the, the, this yucca won't be there anymore. It'll be a hole covered with a dune, covered with sand. But still they're majestic and really beautiful. And as I say, they fall off and they let go of their seeds and then they become buried. As I said before, there's other things that grow out there too. This happens to be that cottonwood that you saw um, earlier with the, with the Milky Way above it. Um, interestingly, they believe there's kind of a row, if you could see this from, from the air, you would see that there's kind of a row of these uh, um, cottonwood trees that kind of dot the landscape. And they believe that there's actually an underground river there that's supplying water to this, this line of cottonwood trees. So White Sands is also a place for animals and people. Um, one of the most amazing things I ever saw at White Sands was um, this uh, track right here that was created by a mastodon uh, a whole long time ago. And what you're actually seeing here is what happened when the animal stepped on the sand and compressed it. And then it got covered up as the sand moved. And then eventually it, 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 the sand moved on. And then of course water came along and it started washing the soft sand away, right? So what you're seeing is actually the imprint of where the, 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 the foot of the animal would have compressed the sand. The other uh, people also came across white sands. This is the Mogollon people. And um, inside this bowl, which is a recreation, is an actual piece of the Mogollon pottery that's in the, uh, that belongs to the Park Service. It was collected out there on the, at White Sands. But the bowl gives you kind of a sense of how elaborate that piece of pottery would have been when it was intact uh, in a bowl. Um, this is called a, a, a matate. And what it is, it's, it's designed, uh, was designed by prehistoric people to grind things like corn. And um, the thing that was so fascinating about this to me was that it looked like it had just been used. And then the sand came along and it covered it up for a very long time. And then recently, you know, the sand, you know, moved on and um, um, it unveiled this thing again, you know, hundreds of years later. And I love the fact that that red rock sits there. 
I didn't make it that way. That's that's just the way it looked. And people. So I I I, I was telling uh, Mary from the museum that um, and Aaron that that. One of the things you have to do when you go to White Sands is you got to go sliding down the dunes at least once. You need to see what that experience feels like, and you you can pick your you can pick your thrill level by deciding you know how tall a dune that you want to go sliding down. Um, and I did it, and it was a whole lot of fun. But another thing that I also did was I photographed people sliding down the hills, and um, these two little kids were quite wonderful, and their parents were quite. Um, um, kind to let me take pictures of them and show them to you. Um, that smile on these kids' faces, you know, is, is the same smile I had on my face when I went sliding down the dunes too. Although I was, in my case, I was, in, it was, for me, it was sheer terror. But I was smiling. It was good. So people use those sand, they use those snow saucers typically. And on the sand, what they do is they apply uh, paraffin to, the, to the, the side that contacts the sand. And once you do that, you just go flying down that sand down the dune. So White Sands is a place where, as I said, people can go and can, in many ways, can kind of make it their own. Um, a lot of people will go there and they will walk their dog, or dogs in this case. That happens to be my daughter right there walking our dogs. Um, but it, it, it is a common sight to see people doing that at White Sands, and they encourage it. You know they really do. Um, they don't want they don't want dogs off lead. But if you have a dog on a lead, they would love it if you went out and you know took them around the uh, around the park. Um, another thing that also had there's my there's my kid. I just wanted to take a moment and show you how pretty she is. Um, but another thing that also happens over at White Sands is that people ride horses, and you'll see a number of you know remain, you know, footprints of, of horses that have been out there. Um, in this case, I invited a couple of friends to come down and ride horses out on the dunes while I photographed them. And um, I, I failed my own, you know, my own rule, which is to always remember that the day isn't over until it's over. Um, it had been a gray day all day. And I you know, I was getting kind of, I was getting tired and they were getting tired. And so I started, you know, putting my gear away and all of a sudden I, I just happened to turn and my God, the sky is going this bright orange. And so fortunately, you know, they were sitting there talking to each other and, you know, their dog Velcro was, was, you know, in profile as well. One image, one picture, one snap, you know, and this is the image that I got. And that's what it looked like right after the sun had, had, had left the sky. It was gray like that through the whole day. And it was gray like that after that. Another thing that happens at White Sands uh, occasionally is there is a man who lives nearby and has two camels. And what he does is he walks them out on the dunes. And I came across him one day um, hiking back from a distant point that I'd hiked to and I made one photograph of him. So if you go to White Sands on Sunday, sometimes he's there wandering around with his camels and he invites people to come over and pet them and talk to them and so on. Another thing that also happens at White Sands is that I take people out on the dunes with our photography workshop program at Oakland Light. And these are some of my students photographing the last little bit of light uh, on this day. So I call White Sands a place with a capital P because it, it's that important to me. Um, someone else thought it was important too and they, you know, um, left, their, uh, left their love of, of White Sands out there on the dunes. And I, I just absolutely love that, that, uh, um, that mark on the dunes. The nice thing about this too is that um, uh, while I don't encourage people to do this kind of thing, nature will, would come along and scrub this. And the following day, this was completely gone. I 
I feel like I should sit down and say as the sun slowly sinks into the west, but I won't, um, or I just did, I suppose. But as I said, the sunsets are absolutely remarkable at White Sands. Um, this happens to be one that, that I made, but I've made hundreds of them. Um, and, I'll, and I'd like to show you a couple now. Um, let's see what we got here. Yeah, here we go. So here you're seeing some, you know, yuccas ready to bloom and some that are already blooming um, at sunset. I struggled for a long time to make an image, to create an image that kind of brought together all of my feelings and brought together all of the things that I was in love with at White Sands. And shortly before I, I had to go to press, I was down at White Sands and I happened to climb up on this, on this ridge and I happened to come across this scene. And I think it just perfectly pulled together all of the things about White Sands that I wanted to share with folks. My publisher, I think, agreed to, and they made it the cover of the of the of the of the book. Another neat thing that sometimes happens is is that there is the presence of the Air Force, which I mentioned earlier from Holloman Air Force Base. And every once in a while, a a um, you'll come across a a a, a jet fly, flying over overhead, um, and you can see if the light is right. You can see a beautiful contrail. I thought a lot about removing this at one point, you know, because digitally I could easily take that out. But I love the line that it creates in the photograph, especially, you know, with all of the shapes of the clouds and the various colors. And so I decided to leave it. I think that it's a, um, 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 I think it's a nice little note to this picture. <coughs> Excuse me. This is actually, I see in the, in the photographs that Aaron sent me, this is the sort of the first image that you see when you enter the show. Um, this was actually the last picture I took at White Sands uh, before we um, just, no, I'm sorry. This is, the la this is the last picture I took at White Sands before we went to press. And um, I sort of like to call this um, the farewell sunset because you know when I went up on this hill by myself, and I sort of thought about, you know, saying goodbye to this place. The sun went down and this is what it gave me. And I'm just tremendously grateful for what, uh, um, what I was given. The sky just seldom disappoints. I love the elemental qualities of white sands, you know, that, 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 that piece of the moon and the gentle, you know, shape of the, of the dune there and that little bit of yucca that points up at the, on the right-hand side and a little bit of orange in the sky to, you know, just to, just to give the eye a little bit of something to, 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 to delight in. Um, So when I do, when I, I've talked a lot over the years about my work, you know, I get invited to, to do things like this. Um, I'm often asked the question, so what next do you ask? Um, and I used to answer it, answer it rather glibly kind of based upon, you know, that commercial that, that the, you know, Walt Disney World uh, um, would answer, you know, they would ask some famous, you know, basketball player, what, you know, what's next? And they would say, I'm going to go to Disneyland. Well, I didn't go off to Disneyland. I'm actually working right now on a series of um, Native American portraits. So I thought I would take just a moment and show you, you know, four or five of these, just so you can kind of see that, you know, my life and my work didn't stop after I finished my work at White Sands.
Thank you so much. I really appreciate you dialing in to see us today. Um, I'm going to be hanging around for questions. And I guess, Aaron, you're going to take care of that? Yes, we actually do have a question. And he asks, how would you photograph White Sands today versus five years ago? Wow. That's a really great question. <laughs> um, I think the first couple of years was sort of figuring out how to photograph the place well, you know, how to make pictures that were sort of, you know, that that spoke to me about what I was feeling when I was at was at White Sands. And so I spent a bit of time having to figure that all out. Um, um, after I did that, um, um, then the pictures started coming. And so I think that if I were going to photograph it today, I would start, I think, knowing a lot more about the place than I did when I first started there. So I hope that's an answer to, a, to the question. I think so. Another question is, are most of your photographs digitally enhanced for publication or are some of them published exactly as the camera captures? No. So that, that's, that, that's a great comment. Um, so the camera goes ahead and it captures uh, everything that it can. And the result, if you leave it in that state, is a really flat photograph. Now, I, I photograph in something called raw, which means that the camera is collecting as much data as it can with the idea that then I take it into some kind of, you know, uh, some kind of software. In this case, I use Photoshop, but there's Luminar and there's Lightroom and there's a bunch, you know, Capture One, there's a bunch of them. But essentially what you have to do is you have to, you know, you have to correct the contrast and you have to correct the exposure and you have to correct the color and everything else. And ultimately what I did was, and I talk a lot about this with my students actually, what I, what I do is I adjust my photographs so they, as I'm looking at them, I am transported back to the moment that I made them. So I'm not worried about trying to create a kind of a one for one kind of thing, but at the same time, it would be easy for me to go ahead and certainly tart these things up, you know, saturate the color, make them sharper, you know, all that kind of stuff um, that I can easily do digitally. So I guess what I want to say is that I try to apply a real uh, gentle hand to the images so that they feel like they're within some realm of reality, depending upon how you define that, you know. Certainly these pictures are within my reality and I'm hoping that the people who view them will feel the same way. I think that if I tart them up too much, people won't believe them and then I will have failed. Okay, I like that answer. A uh, personal question from me, I guess. Do you have a favorite time of day to take photographs? Because I love the sunsets, but those night shots are just spectacular. Aren't they fun? Um, I think it would be easier to answer your question to, to say which time I don't like to photograph, because there, there's only more, like one of them that's my least favorite time to be out photographing, which is like noon. You know, when the sun is directly overhead and the light is coming straight down on the landscape because you need those shadows, you know, to be able to sort of delineate space. You know, this is closer, this is further away kind of thing in the photograph. Without that going on, everything looks flat, essentially. It's all being lit by the same thing. And so I would say that that's, you know, that's, that's the only limiter, you know. But I have made photographs at noon, you know, so there's always exceptions, of course. But if I were to, if I had to guess that the best time to go out and photograph, Usually it's it's in it's in the morning and in the afternoon, you know. But if there's a storm nearby, you know, and it's it, there's not lightning flying all over the place, I'm out there working, you know. I mean, I remember one time I was out hiking out on the dunes and I got caught out there in a snowstorm. And you can imagine what that's like with that white sand and that white, you know, that white snow coming down. I mean, I was it was it, we, I was blind out there. I mean, I couldn't see more than four feet in front of me. And one of the things I recommend to everybody who goes out there is take lots of water, but also take a GPS. And I learned after getting lost one time um, that I never, I, I never went out on the dunes again without a GPS. So I always knew where my car was parked based upon just telling the, the GPS to just take me home. <laughs> so 
So it just kept me safe, you know, it kept me safe. Interestingly, the park told me once, the, the lady who runs law enforcement there told me that the most people that they have to go out and find because they get lost are photographers. Wow. Yeah, it's photographers. Because what happens is you kind of see something, you go, oh, that's kind of cool. And then you run over to that. And then you see, then you see something else and you run over to that. Then you see that and run over to that. And all of a sudden you're out there and you're lost. You know, you're lost. Um, I guess I should stop this, huh? Um, well, I do have a, a comment or a question. Yeah. I love uh, your book, of course. And yeah. I, I like this quote from you. It says, for me, a photograph must be an open-ended conversation. It must contain an invitation to the viewer to wander and to linger and to stay a while. I love that. Because oh, kind. <laughs> a, lot of, <laughs> a lot of times, um, some people will say, well, it's just a mechanical device, you know, right. wh what, what artistic talent does it take to do that? Well, we know different, but I think you put it so well and um, really captured the essence of what you're trying to do. I think that, you know, it's an important component of, of any art, really, is that there has to be a place for the viewer to, to sort of like find the on-ramp, if you will, you know, they have to find a way in in order to appreciate it, because if it is so esoteric and is so abstract, then not everybody's going to get there. Not everybody's going to be able to find their way and appreciate it. Then it becomes just this, this enigma that nobody can understand, you know, and you know, first and foremost, you know, I think that art is, is a way of, 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 of sharing and communicating, you know, um, something. And it doesn't have to be, you know, this is a, this is a red car. It doesn't, have to be, it doesn't have to be that blatant, but maybe it's, it's, it, it's something about, you know, I mean, the, the, my, my favorite, you know, I heard someone say once was that, you know, was the, you know, the picture of the, uh, the Mona Lisa, you know, and the fact that, you know, on some level, the artist was in love with what he was painting, you know, and then you find out later that, you know, the, the, the Mona Lisa is amalgamation of a, of a, of a woman that, that Leonardo knew, and it's a little bit of himself. So, you know, that's an interesting conversation to have in your mind about what that all means exactly. But the fact that there's a way in for you to have that conversation is so, is so incredibly important, you know. Anyway, that's, that's just my take on it. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> well, Aaron? We were talking beforehand that you worked hand in hand with the park service, right? You got them to help you and got their permission to go out there. How much of the photos that you took were parts that the public can't go? Oh, probably. I think there's probably no more than five or six places that you can see in the book that you, the, the average park goer probably could not get to, in part because they either couldn't find them, you know, because they're, they're, they're off in some distance and there's no signs telling you how to get there. Um, or in some case, I mean, I, actually, it's a little bit more than that because everything that's on the missile range, you can't get to at all. So there's probably, I think there's 10 photographs on the missile range, so that's 10 plus six. So it's probably 16 out of the 80 probably represent what, what, what the average person could not get to. So there's still a lot of that park to see. And the cool thing about it is, is that if you see the park at nine in the morning and you go back there at six in the evening, it's a different place. It's not the same place anymore. You know, I mean, I think that's an amazing thing. You know, if you go like, for example, to Yosemite, as an example, go to Bandelier here in New Mexico, you know, um, Bandelier, while it's true, the light changes, you know, while true, the place is absolutely gorgeous, there is a sense that you're looking at the cliff dwellings at Bandelier, whether you're seeing them at nine in the morning or you're seeing them at six in the evening, they change because of the light that falls on them, but that there isn't that drastic change that you see like when you're at White Sands. You don't think you're in the same place anymore at six o'clock in the evening sometimes. Well, it's absolutely incredible. I mean, I really hope we can open so that people can come and see these photos. I know, me too. They're beautiful. Thank you very, very much. Absolutely. I very much appreciate it, Erin. Um, I don't see any other questions. Okay, then, then let me just say thank you. Thank you so much for doing this. Uh, my pleasure. Um, we'll, I'm sure we'll be talking soon. Thanks everybody who, who showed up to, to join us today. Thank you all for joining us and we want to let you know that we do have some other
talks coming up. So let me just share this quickly for you. And we have three more that go along with uh, Snoopy and White Sands that we have up right now. Thursday, September 23rd, we have Dave Dooling coming in to talk about the Apollo missions and New Mexico. We have Thursday, October 7th, Alice Carruth and Chaz Miller with Spaceport America, hopefully gonna give us a virtual tour of Spaceport. I think that's gonna be really exciting. And Thursday, October 21st is Mike Shinneberry from the National Museum of Space History. He's gonna talk to us actually some more about the Trinity site. So Craig was gracious enough to tell us a little bit about his experience with that and the history of it. And we'll get to know a little bit more from Mike. So those are all on Zoom. You can go ahead and register through our Facebook events page. And like Craig had said, we do have some of his books available. They're signed. If you want them, give us a call at 575-492-2678. Because again, sadly, we're closed to the public right now, but we can definitely take care of you and get you a book. You can also still become a member of the museum. That is another great way to support the museum, which also supports the artists that we bring in. So thank you again, Craig, so much for joining us. Thank you. And we will hopefully see you all in one of our next Zoom talks. Thank you. You take good care. Thanks. Have a great evening. Bye.